Hello, I'm uh, Elliot Code and co-founder and MD of Ecology. And today we're joined by the Future Forest Company, who are a tree planting partner in the UK. So they're responsible for the last 5,000, maybe 10,000 trees that were planted uh, up, in, up in Scotland. And uh, we have uh, Jim on the line today to tell us a bit, a bit more about it. But hello, Jill, uh, hello, Jim. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, would you mind just giving us a little bit of a, a background on, on yourself and the Future Forest Company? Sure. Hi, Elliot. Um, great to great to be chatting with you. Um, yeah, um, Future Forest Company was was founded um, with the, the aim of tackling climate change. So through reforestation projects and any other means that we can find to to draw down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, in the hope of averting uh, the climate catastrophe that we're we're targeted on at the moment. And um, so we look to buy land, particularly degraded land and then to plant it up with, with native forest. So these are forests that will be in place hopefully for hundreds of years and we do everything we can to protect that land so that it's not just for, for my lifetime or for the, the, the next 60 years whilst they're sequestering the carbon, but that the forest will stay in place for thousand, hopefully a thousand years and um, will help with the biodiversity crisis that we're also facing, which is, um, not our not our primary focus, but something that we we try and tackle alongside climate change. Absolutely, I love that one too. When you can fight the climate issue as well as restoring nature, and uh, yeah, that's real close to our heart too. Um, when you say planting on degraded land, what do you mean by degraded? So most land in the UK, I would class as degraded. So my my background is um, originally as an ecologist. I did a degree in ecology at Durham University, and when I look at agricultural land, the chemicals we've put on it, the pesticides we've put on it, et cetera, et cetera, degrades the soil. It kills off the soil bacteria and kills off the soil life. And so when we talk about degraded land, it's, it's almost any agricultural land in the UK and it's almost mm -hmm. any hill land in the UK. We have very little land that I wouldn't class as degraded. So in particular, where we've been planting your trees so far is in a site in Ayrshire in southwest Scotland and that was formerly an upland pasture farm so it was sheep and sheep and uh, cows and right. um, rough grazing what would normally be classed mainly as rough grazing some some of it would be hay meadow but most of it would be rough grazing it's probably not that bad compared to some of the agricultural land it won't have been heavily treated with chemicals and fertilizers mm -hmm. and, and and things like that but regardless, this, it's been overgrazed. It's been overgrazed for probably a few hundred years. The soil is is poor, and mm. the life it can support is poor. Right. And so, what uh, I've got a little plan of what we want to talk to, but I, we kind of rarely get to speak to you, and I'm just brimming with um, kind of questions. So, uh, how does that affect the kind of nature's ability to support all the reforestation that you're doing? To, is there a bit of a, a bit of a bit of a slow start potentially compared to whether it was just maybe interplanting in the middle of an existing woodland, for example? Um, what kind of kind of start could it expect, and what extra support would it need? So, in, in this case, we we need to do, or, or, or typically the the land will be um, ploughed to to lift some of the areas of the land. So a single plough line that actually lifts the soil, turns the soil and gives you a ridge to plant on, that gets the trees out of the water where they don't want to be sat in, in, in wet ground. It's a very high rainfall area, one of the highest rainfall areas in the UK, which is great for tree growth, but not great for getting them started. So mm -hmm. that would typically be done. And on most of the land there, it was, was ridged to, to give the trees a good start and there is some existing woodland in some of the gullies which is also good because that means you've got a, a a relatively good seed mix which will start to come through after the planting but typically we we plant the land because it gets it going a lot quicker rather than waiting for natural regeneration and that's what 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 your ecology supporters are are doing and helping us to do they're helping to pay for those those young trees to go into the ground and um, to accelerate that whole process. Once the trees are in, they start helping that soil biology. Their, their leaf drop every year adds fertility back to the soil 
and um, the soil will start to change, will start to build, and then other biological life will start to move back in, insects, bacteria, and, and up the food chain from there to, um, we have a lot of voles there now, um, which are actually a problem because they actually will eat the trees if we don't protect the trees when we put them in. Yeah. Um, but that's the life starting to come back. And hen harriers and, and birds of prey that are, that are actually trying to, trying to catch the voles um, we have, you know, it, it, in an area that was short of birds of prey and things, we see hen harriers on a regular basis on that site now, and they're quite a, a heavily endangered species. Wow. And if I think about, um, if you were just to let the land loose compared to your influence here, um, I guess there's two parts of it. One is making sure that the land is there to be used for such a purpose. And the other part of it is like your influence on the land, like supporting it. Like, what difference does it have? Um, you know, if it was just like an unused bit of land, is there unused land, you know, for another 50 years, would it just spring back? And or are we looking at completely different timescales? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question because there's an argument that, that land springs back better if it's just left. The problem is just left doesn't really work in the UK. And the reason it doesn't work is because we've taken out all the top level predators. There's no lynx, there's no wolf. And, and I'm not going to get into the, the lynx wolf reintroduction argument because that's a whole, yeah. whole other topic for us. But without those top level predators and with the number of deer that we have in the UK, then regeneration doesn't occur unless you fence out the deer. So your minimum intervention is to fence the land and then let it naturally regenerate. There's, there is an argument for doing that. Um, there's, there's two schools of thought. Um, we're, we're more on the side of let's get it done quickly and let's make this happen because we need to draw carbon dioxide out of the air as fast as possible. And by preparing the land a bit, by using existing trees, um, your, your regeneration cycle starts quicker. Is the quality of that regeneration then quite as good? Some people would argue not. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a it, it's a difficult a difficult area, but it won't it won't regenerate without intervention. And there are examples where there are sites in Upper Teesdale which have been fenced to stop livestock, with the view that this will regenerate nicely. Virtually no change in I think it's about forty years now that site's been fenced. And it just demonstrates how far we've degraded that land and how much work there is to do to help it start off again. Um, right. So there's a point probably where nature has been pushed too far by our activities and we need to give it a kickstart. And then I think you back off, you get the trees back mm. in there, back off, let nature take over and let nature look after that land to, to a large degree. But let's right. get it started. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you help mimic the kind of the natural process, um, you know, for those kind of early stages, it's like the kind of tree selection and saplings, like, what do you start with? Is it is it seeds? Is it saplings from a nursery? And what varieties? So we, we work with saplings um, because of the speed and we typically work with plug um, trees. So they have a small amount of roots already on. You can plant bare root as well, which are out of season dormant trees. Um, but by using plugs, we can plant year round in some areas, which is what we try and do to spread it, spread the planting. Um, and that means that in summer, we can still plant in the wetter areas, but we plant the right species in the right place. Or we do the best we can. Nature will eventually take over and tell us if it's wrong and something yeah. will die and something will replace it. But to get it started, we try and get the right species in the right place. So a lot of the planting we've been doing recently and that um, your customers have been supporting has been alder and birch, um, native birch, so um, downy birch trees. And they go typically in the wetter areas of the site um, where they like to have, we, we talk about it as they like to get their feet wet and they yeah. like to sit in a, a bit of water. They don't like to dry out too much. And so, so that's where we've been planting alder and birch and they're doing right. really, really well. I see. And so we're talking about Scotland here. I don't know what, like, are you from, are you from Scotland? No, it Well, sound originally like it. I was, I know, I don't, I'm not, no, I've not lived in Scotland for a long yeah. time. I was born in Scotland and I'm back right. in Scotland on our uh, working close to the sites now so that I can be close I to the sites that we're working on. Just wondering about, um, 
is there any inherent advantages to what you're doing in Scotland in terms of reforestation compared to, you know, we're based out in Bristol? Um, you say it's wetter. Um, like, what what importance does that have, and like, how does it affect things? Obviously, you know, maybe too much wet is a, is a thing. Um, obviously, you have to kind of mitigate that. How is it different to say planting down here in the southwest? So, so it wouldn't be that different in terms of planting. You'd need slightly different species as you've probably got slightly lower rainfall levels, but not dramatically so. The whole of the UK has got reasonably good rainfall, apart from perhaps as you get over to the, the east side. But the difference mainly is competition for agricultural land. You all have a, a large amount of fairly intensively managed land for arable crops, um, for for orchard crops, which we associate obviously with, with that area of the country. And these are intensive, intensive farming activities. And as such, that makes the land um, particularly valuable. Where we've got extensive agriculture of often hill farms, the land is um, therefore not valued as high. And it means we can have a greater impact for, for, less, um, for less money. And that's part of the reason that we, we like to work in, in Scotland. And um, the other thing is, there's a lot less people. So there's a lot less um, challenges to actually getting permissions to do things to, to restore that, that landscape. And much as people generally like trees, there's, there seems to always be somebody who, who doesn't want trees somewhere yeah. for some reason. And why is that? You're pres presumably buying land for as if you were going to agriculturally work it, but you're buying the land to plant trees on it. Is there any... Is that right? You're, you're buying it as if you were a farmer, um, but you're planting trees, or is there a separate way of you getting hold of this land? No, we're, we're competing effectively for farmland. So when we buy land, it's, it's typically farms, um, and then we, we look to reforest it. Yeah. Um, so why, so is, why, is there, why is it then diff difficult to say, instead of uh, growing crops, that you're actually planting trees? Is there a separate thing you would have had to have asked for, to have permission? Yeah. Permission? You, yeah, we, we need to go through a permission cycle um, for, for reforesting, for planting those trees. And, and it's a landscape protection mechanism, same as planning permission for building houses, really. Um, it changes the nature of the environment that we all live in. And there are a number of areas, particularly in southern Scotland now, where they, they are quite opposed to planting, particularly of conifer forests because right. they've got conifer forests all around them and, and they're just a, they're a, a landscape change. They are not very good for wildlife typically. And that means that it, it's often seen as detrimental to, to the environment that people live in. And, and we've got to always remember that, that um, it's all well and good championing nature, but we've also got people in that landscape and, and people, um, also have their, their view on it and we need to listen to that as well. So we're striking delicate balances often between what people perceive land should be used for or has been used for mm. historically and the value that we believe should be there for nature and should be shared with people. Very interesting. And talking of, kind of value, so we're working with you. One of the first reasons that we came to work with you is that you somehow managed to find a bit of a secret source of how to plant a tree quite uh, affordably. Um, there are lots of other projects where we could be looking at that we were looking that we're talking to, where it's maybe about twenty pounds a tree, fifteen pounds maybe at best. But um, working with you, it's in the kind of handful of pounds a tree, you know, obviously varying on site. So, uh, like, how is it that you've been able to achieve such a thing? Like, what goes into that kind of overall kind of value? Yeah, so so as I, we've already discussed, land values are slightly cheaper in Scotland, which reduces some of the, the cost. We are often supported with some grant funding for reforestation as well. And where by the time we've, we've done that, plus we've used volunteers often for helping with planting, then we can reduce the cost down to, to something that is, um, is much more acceptable for people. And um, that's been our, our aim has to be not to make money off the tree planting, but to get the trees in the ground as quick as we can. Our, our organization is measured on impact. So one of our key things is how many trees can we plant? How much land can we get under management and how fast can we make that happen? And then we utilize that land. So 
We are also experimenting at the moment with things like spurting biochar, which is another way of locking carbon dioxide and enhanced weathering, which is using um, basalt rock that we crush to spread on the land. And, and these experiments, um, which are various different stages, should hopefully demonstrate that we can utilize that land for even more environmental good than just the tree planting over right. time. And so that there's, there's are added layers to what we're doing. We're not just planting trees. And there's some great organizations doing tree planting, uh, but they, they seem to be very much focused on a single aspect of buying land, putting trees in the ground. We, we are a bit broader and because our remit is really climate change, trees are part of that. But as long as we can, your, your customers are helping to cover the cost of those trees and we've got some subsidies from, from yeah. government funds for grants, then then we don't we don't mind. Just get them in the ground. Yeah. Get them in the ground yeah. quickly. Absolutely. It's really, really interesting that kind of almost like layering of uh potential revenue streams because I know when you buy a hectare of land, it's you know, it comes with a set price. But if you can uh, you know, maybe a grant, you know, from government and you know, some experimental biochar side of things, that's uh, mega interesting it also brings the price down per hectare um but with the with the biochar and enhanced weathering like what what is that so just you know exp just expand a bit so we've got your trees being planted in the ground like within the the feet of the trees or in a separate area or what are you what are you doing yeah so it's so a biochar is basically a charcoal like product that's that's crushed it has a large surface area it's virtually pure carbon so it's sort of 75 to 90 percent pure carbon and it's a way of of taking biomass so any anything whether it be forest waste or it could be straw it could be even cardboard or paper any carbon um containing product can be processed through um, pyrolysis which is burning it in the absence of oxygen to produce biochar and biochar is a way of locking up carbon. So if you if you get your process right, you pyrolyze it at the right temperature, you will lock up 90% of that carbon for at least 100 years. And that enables us to, to store carbon from materials that would normally rot down. So when something decomposes, it releases CO2 and methane typically. So you avoid that release of those two greenhouse gases and you store it as carbon instead. We then spread that on the ground amongst the trees and they that then acts, acts as a soil amendment it's got a very large surface area so to give you an idea one gram of biochar if you could spread it out flat would have the surface area of two tennis courts and that's all area that bacteria can colonize so you're effectively creating a platform for the soil bacteria to to colonize and 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 enhance the the work they can do so everything can then happen quicker in the soil so that's the benefit of biochar to the trees as well as water retention and drainage mm. so it helps nice. both improve the drainage and retain water in times of drought so and you, it's and do, do you have clever. customers yeah do you have customers for biochar like, so you, we, like, it's just it's just about the trees or, or we, would any would anyone fund the biochar production that you had here so, yeah so so we we are looking at selling biochar to, to carbon customers, so people who want to um, buy carbon offsets. So it's a way of storing carbon that could, it, it, depending on the, the, the feedstock we use, then then we believe, in fact, we've got customers ready to buy those carbon offsets from us for the carbon that we've locked up in, in the biochar. Um, particularly if it's a waste product that we know would rot down like forestry waste. So what's left after, you know, when they clear a conifer forest and there's branches everywhere and, and they just leave it to rot, that sort of product where we know the carbon is going to be released again because it's going to be left to rot. If we can intercept that, turn it into biochar, then yes, there's, there's carbon credits we can sell, which helps us to to support the the work we're doing in terms of restoring ecosystems. Fascinating, absolutely. And uh, enhanced weathering is that just a, a different beast? What's involved there? Yeah, so that that's that's far more probably far less less advanced, I would say, um, and the the science is, is is reasonably well established but how well it works in in the field is yet to be understood and we're working with scientists for that 
but it involves the crushing of rocks that will react to take um, with rainwater to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and permanently lock it up. So, so when enhanced weathering um, is done, it's 100,000 years you're locking the carbon up for. This is permanent, absolute permanent removal from the atmosphere. And the potential of it is, is huge. You, you, there are studies that suggest there's 430 billion tonnes worth of carbon removal under the UK in terms of the rocks. Now, it's not all extractable. People will get upset if you start taking down some of the mountains for it. But, but, but there's certainly very, very big potential for, for mitigating climate change with this technology if, if we can get it into a scalable format. And that's quite mm. complicated because yeah. there's a lot of energy for crushing, there's a lot of energy for extraction. And what you've got to be careful of is you don't start using diesel to extract it, diesel to crush it, you know, using lots of oil-based products and releasing a lot of carbon dioxide in the process. Um, but we're but we're making good progress on that, I think. Mm, really interesting. Um, and talking of scale, so when, when it comes to your own tree planting, we've got our own site in Dolry that our ecology subscribers have been funding. Um, that was a bit of a test site. Uh, well, like certainly in the initial site, you know, relatively speaking, yeah, what kind of size is it and where, where are you moving to? What's, what's in the pipeline? Yeah, so so that site is 430 acres. So it's still it's still quite sizable. Um, but we've we've recently agreed to purchase a couple more sites. So um, another one not far from from that initial site in Ayrshire, um, which is about 350 acres, so slightly smaller than than that first one, um, but quite local to it. There's another thousand acre sheep farm that we've agreed to buy um, in southwest Scotland, um, which will be a bit more a bit more interesting in some ways. So it will be native tree planting and also peatland restoration, which is really important. Um, so peatland is, is really bad if it's been drained and often it's been drained for agricultural purposes and it has on that site. So it's probably losing about 19 tons of carbon dioxide per hectare per year on the, the drained peatland. And we'll restore that by blocking drains, re-wetting it, and hopefully stop the degradation of that peat, and, and it'll slowly build up again over the coming years. But it'll take—it's a very slow process, peatland building. Um, and then, what kind of, well, what also, was this, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. There's a little follow-up question. Uh, what kind of support will you have with the peatland peatland restoration? Obviously, you can't do this unless you can help support the organisation that's doing it. Like, are there customers for that, or is there a, is there a grant for that? Like, what's the incentive? There, there isn't really. We see, in the moment, we see that as part of our obligation. So, so the way we view land ownership is, is not as, uh, not as an asset, if you like, but as a, 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 an obligation we take to look after that land. So when we buy land, we see it as a responsibility, not as, not as an asset class, if you like. And so we will do that regardless because it needs doing, but it is quite expensive to do. Um, we are exploring models to see if there are ways that we can um, help help with the cost of that through sponsorship um, and see if we can put together sponsorship methods where people can sponsor a block of peatland to help us restore that. And therefore, you know, everything that we do where we get sponsorship for something or somebody um, pays for a tree planting, it accelerates the work we can do and allows us to scale up quicker. And so we're looking at models, but we haven't. We haven't tested anything. We haven't released anything yet. But yeah, if you if you're interested, then then peatland restoration, we'd love to find a way of of making that um, cost effective because then we could do more of it. I see. Oh, it's just uh, it's incredible, and I love the kind of symbiosis. Oh no, no, the kind of the ability to to help the land in multiple ways. You know, through reforestation and then adjacent kind of coastal areas, and uh, and then obviously the peatland. It's yeah, really fascinating. I get quite excited about um, kind of the opportunity for nature to be restored. Like, do you have any indication of of what's going to happen around the area? I mean, having uh, me having read the Isabella Tree um, book recently about uh, kind of the kind of concept of rewilding, rewilding, letting nature do its thing if protected, um, and in that site, just insane, fascinating things are happening. Like, as, can, can we be ex expecting similar kind of re advancement of biodiversity and uh, variation of, of life that might be in these sites? 
I, I hope so. Um, we, you know, when you take off sheep, particularly that are grazing across a large area, they 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 overgraze it, um, and they might not be overstocked, but they'll still graze the things they prefer to eat a lot heavier than the things they don't like to eat, and and that leads to over time a degradation of the species mix. And and when we look at the species, so we do baseline studies when we go onto a new site, and the 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 species diversity is pretty poor, even where woodland has been replaced for a number of years. Um, the, the species diversity doesn't come back quickly. You need quite a lot of disturbance to, to make that happen. And one of the things that we do is we actually have some woolly pigs and they're part of our, um, uh, our method for, for disturbing the soil. And you need the disturbance sometimes to allow the seed bank to come back up to the surface. So you want the seed bank back to the surface and you want to, to change what's there, particularly where you've got thick bracken. And bracken, if anybody who's not familiar with it, forms a really thick mat of dead bracken, and then only bracken can push through it. So over a number of years, the bracken will completely take over an area. And it could do that underneath woodland as well. And you end up with a very poor species mix when that happens. Um, the, the woolly pigs that we have are very tough outdoors. They live outdoors all year. We put shelter for them, but they don't seem to ever use it. Um, but we're obligated to give them shelter, but they choose yeah. to just lie in a big pile of pigs under the trees. <laughs> and they yeah. go through and will trample the bracken, clear the bracken, and give space for, for life to come back, as well as adding wow. nutrition to the soil. So, yeah, we've, we've got the baseline studies, and, and we'll, we'll tell you in a few years' time yeah. what, what yeah. happens. I think any, any kind of long-term follower of ecology will have seen the woody pigs that you're talking about. Um, is, that, is that just a bit of a, I don't know, where do, I, I don't know, is that quite commonplace to just add sprinklings of woolly pigs in the UK reforestation or is that one of your trademark moves um, to get it started? It's absolutely fascinating about the kind of the overcoming the bracken issue, which um, I, I think that's incredible. Um, yeah, I mean, was, was that always an obvious obvious move to have the sites accompanied by uh, those woolly pigs? So I think so. I think I think you've got to bring... In a situation where you've got a degraded wildlife, you need to bring in things that can mimic what would be there in nature. So where there would be wild boar naturally in the UK, and there are, you know, were native species here, you, you bring something in to replace that, something that can do, do the job. Because if you don't, you end up with everything out of balance. Now, clearly, we can't bring back the, the large predators that would move on, move deer on and things to allow a regeneration to happen. But where we've got um, a substitute like the woolly pigs, and the woolly pigs were selected because, one, because they're really tough. They, they, they live outside all year. They don't mind snow. They don't mind rain. They're just, they're just bulletproof pigs. Very old breed, um, very close to the wild boar in terms of their, their breeding, but a lot more placid. And we don't have to have dangerous animal licenses for them because they're a lot more placid. And um, so they're a, a really good substitute for the wild boar. And yeah, they're, they're a key, a keystone species in the ecosystem. So you bring them back to, to drive the ecosystem. Yeah, that's incredible. I think when, um, what's, what's amazing with working with Future Forest Company is uh, when we have our members plant a tree, then um, the, our members actually get to see a, a photo of that individual tree. GPS location um, and the species as well. It's absolutely like amazing, especially when there's like a, a world of doubt, you know, kind of like I bought this tree, but where, where really is it? And I, I actually need to see my tree, but often when you're trying to keep costs down, it's really difficult to do such a thing. Um, it's amazing for you to see that information. And um, it's something that I've kind of been out of the back of my mind for a while, but with that GPS information, um, kind of pie in the sky a little bit, but do you think in the future you could have um, kind of aerial drone footage passing over those sites and and then kind of once a month or once every six months kind of aggregating maybe just like a little still kind of time lapse of of that site is that possible i think it'd be absolutely incredible to have um to be able to kind of as a as a member to go and see your tree and then have it almost like a little video feed develop over time yeah, we, we'd love to do some things like that. And obviously, you know, we, 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 we've got a techie edge where we do things like get the individual picture of the tree and things. And um, we, we have drone footage 
in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we can supply you with some drone footage. We had drone footage done recently of Prodigy where your trees are planted and um, we can share that with you and we'll go back and do that on a regular basis. It's part Great. of it's part of what we want to do. We want people to to see what we've done to to engage in the story and, and to understand the, the wider impacts of their of their contribution, because it's really important that that people reconnect with nature and We've got great tools nowadays with things like drones, um, which enable people to reconnect even if they can't actually be there on the site and don't ever get to visit their tree, although they're welcome to visit their tree and come and check on how yeah. it's doing. Um, yeah. They can see the health of the forest if they can't see their individual tree. Um, it might be longer term, we can get down to individual tree level, mm. but that needs a bit more, uh, yeah, a bit more technically challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's um, it's amazing and a pursuit worth um, worth well uh, well worth kind of putting yourself onto, and you'd be really well rewarded for it because you know everyone, myself included, is kind of like wondering about the impact we're making, and you know, ecology. Our team would be up there a whole lot more often, but you know, it's kind of in a Hebrides sort of area. I mean, that we're kind of broaching into the for the next site especially, and uh, oh yeah, just being able to see it kind of like present it is is incredible. Cool. I think I think that's kind of I think that's been like some of my kind of top questions. I was had a bit of a kind of off the menu um, kind of like look of what I want to ask, but it was amazing to kind of really get into some of the finer details of what you're what you're doing there. But uh, we are wholeheartedly heartedly looking forward to like supporting you as you your organisation continues to develop and um, yeah, just being closer and, and working with with what you're up to so it's been fascinating and thank you very much jim and uh looking forward to having a bit of an update from you next time likewise and thank you for your time